you today. We've brought together three wonderful people who I'm so excited to have sharing the same stage because it's been a pleasure and an honor to get to know each of them individually through my various travels through the cybersecurity world. Uh, we've got um, Molly Sauter, who is a research affiliate at the Berkman Center for Internet and Society, Harvard Law School, as well as a doctoral student at McGill, um, and also an affiliate researcher at the Center for Civic Media at the Media Lab at MIT. Um, her research is broadly focused on hacker culture, digital activism, and depictions of technology in the media. And she's the author of The Coming Swarm, which is a great analysis of the history and development of, hacti of activist distributed denial um, service actions. Uh, we've then got Lieutenant General Edward Cardone, who's commanding general of US Army Cyber Command. He served his nation for over three decades since his commissioning as an engineer officer from West Point in 1982. And part of what he brings to this role is an incredibly diverse set of experiences, um, multiple tours in places like Iraq and Bosnia, as well as time on the strategy side in the Pentagon, uh, as well as in the schoolhouse, which is, I think, we first connected out at Fort Leavenworth, and now in his role as commanding general, leading all um, Army cyber resources and personnel. And then finally, we've got Nate Fick, CEO at Endgame. Um, Nate was a graduate of Dartmouth, who then joined the Marine Corps as an infantry officer, served in Afghanistan and Iraq, an experience that he captured in the powerful book, One Bullet Away. He received his MBA and um, Master in Public Policy at Harvard, and then made the mistake of um, joining my field as a profession, uh, joining a think tank, um, becoming the CEO of Center for New American Security. And three years ago, he saw the light and um, left the think tank field and became CEO of Endgame, uh, which is a cybersecurity solutions provider. So, I'm gonna ping them with questions for the first half and then move on to open it up to you. And the first question is I really wanna hit, we've got up here folks with expertise in the hacktivist community, the military, as well as the business world. Maybe first frame for us the culture. How, do you, how would you define and describe the human culture within each of these sectors and how it connects to the sense of finding the personnel, finding the people? Molly, why don't we go first? Well, more so than I think in the national defense sector or in the private defense sector, uh, hacktivism, when we talk about it, is mostly a suite of tools and tactics that can be picked up and used by really anybody. Um, so when we talk about who are the hacktivists who are sitting on the, behind the keyboard sort of on the ground, you can really be talking about virtually anyone of any sort of political slant, of any sort of national or regional identity of origin. Um, but I think for the most part, we're talking about people who are operating in either loosely organized small groups when you're talking about hacktivists who are developing and deploying tools or very large, more culturally oriented groups when you're talking about less technically challenging, more disruptive types of activism. But we're still talking about primarily people in the West, primarily people who use English as a sort of language of currency between them, that at least that's the type of people that we would deal with most sort of for our national interests and on our shores. Um, different countries have their own different profiles for hacktivists, um, and they tend to stay mostly involved with their own national politics. Um, so it's difficult given, to answer. Give an illustration of how that differs across countries. In so much as any activist population will differ depending on the national origin, each region and each nation will have their own set of priorities that different activists are concerned with. And so different activist populations can vary greatly between nations. Um, an activist profile in the Middle East will be different than an activist profile in China, for instance, and will be different than an activist profile in Ferguson, Missouri. Okay. General. So people are the name of the game here for us, without question. So if you look at cyber, cyber grew really out of two communities across the services. It grew out of either the intelligence service or out of the communication services. But what's become increasingly clear, if you believe cyber is a domain, and there was a panel on that earlier, is that uh, you need a full combined, what well, we'd say a combined arms approach. You need all of the disciplines organized in this space. So that's my first point. The second point is uh, there's no way to know all the technology. And so you have to have this incredible passion to learn. And to have a passion, I describe it as to win. Either win 
like I can absolutely solve this problem and we're going to throw ourselves against it until we do, or I'm absolutely not going to let this happen and we're going to make sure it doesn't. The next piece is the ability to be a team player, and I normally define this as no one knows all code, no one knows all hardware. And so rarely do you see it be solely one person, but it's your ability to interact as part of a team. And then my boss, Admiral Rogers, was up here earlier, and there's a character piece of this. And the character piece of this is we allow you to do a lot of very interesting things, but you must operate inside of a legal framework and we have to know that you'll do that when no one's looking. So Nate, you've um, in many ways traveled between worlds, um, we could say. How do you both describe what you see as the corporate culture when it comes to cybersecurity, but maybe also how you see it differing from, say, when you were on the public policy side or serving in the Marine Corps? Sure. Uh, I would just say being here today, I'm glad I'm not on the public policy side anymore because you guys are a formidable competitor. Uh, <laughs> this, is a, this is a great event, Peter. Um, my observation fundamentally would be that the security community really is a community to a greater extent than most industries. And yeah, the competition on the business side is cutthroat and intense, but there's an enormous amount of collaboration uh, and sharing on the technical side and the threat intelligence side. So you have this, this interesting juxtaposition of, of uh, kind of hard fought competition with uh, genuine spirited collaboration and you need to find the right balance if you're going to recruit and retain the right people. Uh, we try to infuse our values into everything we do, and they can't just be something you paint on the wall. They have to be something you live in an organization um, and trust that over time that's going to infuse the DNA of a team in a way that's going to allow you to continue recruiting and then retaining the right people. Because I think any of us uh, recognize in human organizations the DNA self-replicates. If you get it right, it replicates the right way and it gets better, and if you get it wrong, it replicates the wrong way and it gets worse. So uh, for us, those values are, are very straightforward. It's um, integrity, uh, boldness, speed, openness, and responsibility. And, and try to push those values into everything you do and every decision you make so that people in the organization can make decisions on their own without guidance. And as long as they're acting in accordance with the values, they're probably going to be right. Um, more concretely, though, in terms of thinking about talent um, and the culture of talent in this space, um, I guess I think of it in terms of what do people want, that is, why do people join a team, and what do people hate, why do people quit a team, um, and try to maximize what they want and minimize what they hate. And um, what people want, there's, there's, I mean, a fair amount of data on this, people want three things. They want mastery, they want the ability to develop a skill and exercise it, they want autonomy, uh, they don't want to be screwed with in everything they're doing, and they want purpose, they want to know that what they're doing matters. So if you can maximize mastery, autonomy, and purpose, while minimizing the things people don't want, um, and, and I think there are at least two of them. Um, people don't want to feel disconnected from the mission of the place. Everybody has to understand why they wake up in the morning and come in and pour their life force into what it is they're doing. So you need to connect them with the overall mission at an individual level. Uh, and people want to work with and for good people. So people quit because they don't like their boss. I mean, that's sort of a fundamental truth in, in a lot of organizations. Um, so again, back to DNA, get the DNA right, make sure you have it self-replicating the right way. Um, and, and, it, and it goes a long way. Uh, in terms of contrast, I would just say the, the big difference in, in the corporate world relative to, I think, the military and public policy, although we all deal with this to some extent, is it's just such a mobile workforce. If the, you know, the average job tenure of a baby boomer was ten, about 10 years, the average tenure of a Gen Xer, my generation, is about four or five, and the average tenure for a millennial, which is most of our employees, is two. Um, so it's a highly mobile workforce. So we were talking earlier about your day-to-day -day, uh, running your company, and you said a huge amount of your day is spent on recruiting because you're, in essence, you're hiring a person, is it one, one a week or one a day? About one a week. One a week. So walk us through the recruiting process, that is, how you find the talent and how do you draw them in? Yeah, I'm going to ask the same question, in essence, of each of you sort of in the different parts of the ecosystem that you're within. So, uh, I mean, a nice thing is the, the world's our oyster, right? There no, you, we can sort of go anywhere um, uh, within, within reason. And um, I, I guess there are basically three steps. First is you've you got to define the role that you're looking to fill because, you know, I've, I've certainly learned by hard experience just hiring great people and throwing them into the mix and trusting them to figure it out isn't always a recipe for success. So figure out what the problem is you're trying to solve. Um, 
And then, you know, I believe very strongly in, in, in the sort of wisdom of crowds in, in, in hiring. Um, I, I don't think that individuals make better hiring decisions than small groups. So uh, we, we try to get a, a small group of people together, uh, cross-functional, uh, different levels of seniority in the company, um, essentially a 360 degree interview. Um, and then the third piece of it is a piece that is too often forgotten, it's the onboarding. Um, you, know, you can spend a lot of money and, and go to a lot of expense and, and, and time and energy in recruiting, but if you mess up the person's first day, first couple of weeks, first 90 days, uh, then it was all for naught. So you've got to be just as rigorous, I think, in the onboarding as you are in the actual recruiting. General, you, your organization, in essence, has gone from zero to, I think, you know, a year ago we met and it's two functional units to now 35, 25. 25. The recruiting, the, the pipeline of how, do you, how are you drawing people in? How is that? Yeah, so let me answer this a couple ways. So first, the one thing that the Army's done recently is they've created a branch. So much like we have infantry and armor and field artillery, now we have a cyber branch. So for the officer side, uh, we have uh, roughly 300 spaces, if I have my number right there. We had over 1,100 applicants for the first 30% that we were onboarding. And so there's tremendous interest, which gives us a lot of options. Why, why do you think there's that interest? Uh, I think there's a lot of interest in cyber. Uh, and I think oh, there's a lot of people that have degrees in the force or see the future here in this. Uh, we, uh, and this is coming from across all of those other 17 branches. So you, I'm gonna push you on that. The future of it, this is the future of war. This is the future of my profession. This is the future for me when I exit the force and get a great paying job. I, th I actually think there's components of all three playing in those. I, I think there's some that actually see this as uh, it's a different way of looking at operations and they want to be in the forefront of this, you know. Some describe it, you know, as the start of the airplane, right? There's others, of course, that are looking, this will make me more, more competitive. We can normally find them fairly uh, easily, but I think a lot of them are excited about the future mission. Now for the soldiers, oh, and so, and, and this also goes to the academy. So we've got 15 cadets from West Point being directly commissioned into cyber, and 15 from the Reserve Officer Training Corps. But the demand is huge. We could take a lot more if we had spaces for them. For the soldiers, uh, specifically uh, for the high-end operators, they have a six-year enlistment. To show you the interest in this, you must have a really high what we uh, technical score first, and then we'll give you another test to see if you have a propensity for this space, because you don't have to have a hard degree uh, in this. And uh, for the Army, we filled 75% of our positions in the first quarter. So the re no incentives, no waivers, it's just straight. And I think that's because they see this as, an, again, a huge opportunity. And then finally, it's the civilians. And so 30% of the force will be civilians. And this is much more challenging, but I think what you're gonna see the Army develop within the next year will be its own cyber career field for civilians because we have to have a way to manage the talent and work the leader development in this space. And what'll be the key elements of it having a career field? I mean, there's a lot of folks in this room who don't come from a military DOD background. Yeah. What, what is distinct about it being a career field? You mean for the civilians? Yeah. Uh, Well, let me kind of go at this a different way. So here's, here's a challenge in the way the government's organized, right? Like you cannot be working at the NSA and come work at Army Cyber because those personnel systems don't interact. If Nate wanted to come work for Army Cyber for a year, there's no way for me to really do it. We're not set up that way. The whole system's not set up that way. Yet, you could see that if you get the right civilians, the, the first thing, I think we need, we need a better government private partnership in this space, I think we could absolutely get people from private industry into Army Cyber for two years, and then they want to go back out. They don't want to stay in there forever. But for those two years, they can make a real difference in what they're doing. And so right now, because when you come in, you're hired against a very specific position with a very specific well-defined route, and that's not really what we need in this space. I can't tell you what that's gonna look like five years from now. Mm -hmm. So in many ways, the question for uh, 
the activism part of the ecosystem is not as you know process oriented. It's um, possibly not as top down. When a network forms, when the network of what is the spark that allows it to form? And then what allows people to go out and recruit others to join in when it becomes more directed as opposed to just a spark? So this is actually one of the key questions in social movement studies in general, is what causes movements to form and be successful where there has been a long-standing grievance? Um, and one current example of this is the Ferguson protests. Um, there have been, there's been an anti-police brutality movement in this country for decades, for nearly all of the last century. Um, there's been a nascent movement, and the question is, what is it about the Ferguson moment that coalesced that movement into a strong, powerful, vocal, and influential movement? And this is why social movement studies exist, because we don't have necessarily an answer to that. Online, you sort of have a similar thing, as you have long-standing cultural level grievances where people are coming together in these online communities and talking about these problems and questions that they have, and then there's always an inciting event. Something happens, a law is passed or a law is not passed, someone is arrested, someone dies, someone is convicted of a crime, and that's when you get this spark uh, and things start to congeal very rapidly. So one example of that was the uh, Sopa Pipa protests. We had been so the activist community has been pushing activism against Sopa Pipa for as long as they had been aware of it, and it wasn't until the corporations stepped in and you had you know, Wikipedia and Google and Facebook step in and say, we're willing to take a part in this protest, that it sort of made the jump from just something people who cared about the internet talked about to something that everybody was talking about. Do you see the same, obviously it differs by topic, but is there often a core group that sort of moves over from topic to topic? Another way of asking this is, um, and I'll, I'll ping back to you all, is is there, even though it seems to be a network that's self-selecting, is there actually a hierarchy that plays out? Or at least if critical nodes or people who go out and recruit, we need this particular kind of talent for this particular operation, oh, this was someone I linked back with on Ferguson, let's bring him into this. Yeah, there are always core organizers and often different actions and movements will share those organizers because people who are excited about being civically involved tend to be excited about being civically involved in a lot of things. And so it's not, it's, it's not quite so mercenary as that. You're not necessarily just saying like, we'll pull you from movement to movement, but people are organically moving from action to action, movement to movement because they genuinely care about all of these issues. And similarly to on the street activism, you have an, an organizing core of people who have the experience, who have the knowledge, who have the energy and willingness to put huge parts of their lives on hold while they engage in necessary political organizing and activism, and it's often a, and that's a very small core. And are we seeing an evolution in the type of organization that is what's working well in one situation versus another. Oh, that the particular way we organized around this topic didn't succeed, so let's jettison that, or do we see a legacy effect? In many ways, it's a different way of act, asking, do we see um, bureaucracy within what's seemingly a flat space? Yes, there's always bureaucracy in these types of organizations. You often can't see it. Often the media isn't super interested in covering sort of the gears of organization. Um, it's much more exciting to have pictures of street protests and marches and things being on fire than it is to actually talk to the people who are behind the organizations. Um, and similarly to online actions, it's much more exciting to talk about a DDoS sometimes than it is to talk about how these organizations function at a basic level. Um, and so we often, what we think of as grassroots organizations and aggressively horizontal organizations have leadership structures just like any other organization that we would think of. So General, uh, it's been said of the current sp space of warfare that it's highly networked. And then as um, General Stan McChrystal described, it takes a network to defeat a network, except there's no more hierarchical organization than the military. Um, how are you approaching this blend of um, organizing something new 
but also, in essence, um, you're stuck with old legacies and structures that you're not going to be able to come out of. When you're building these units, what's new, what's different, and what's, what, what are you bringing in from before? Yeah, so I think, I think we have an advantage here from the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan because a lot of those structures got broken down because you had to operate flat. You had to create a network to fight a network. Now, it doesn't mean we don't have hierarchies, but the formal and informal structures that developed from the wars and you know, things like the Baghdad fusion cells, some of these kind of innovations that just flattened everything, and it was more of a unity of effort, not even unity of command, to accomplish specific missions. I see that as a characteristic in this space. I've had discussions recently with the senior leadership on maybe Maybe the word command in this space is not right. Maybe it's the way that we organize against very specific missions, and that is your leadership opportunities. And then what are the skills and attributes that we need to be able to do that? And that includes not just what's in the military, but how do you bring in other governmental agencies, and in some cases, the private industry side. And so I think that, that we're going to have to have a network to work against this, because I don't think one person will be able to have the wherewithal to even, um, you might get it on the right azimuth, but going to Nate's point, I'm a bit of crowdsourcing on this. You know. But how do you do that with, um, how do you deal with factors like unit cohesion, if, if the network's constantly forming, deforming? How do you um, carry through tradition? So you know, as an example, yeah. you have cyber, Army Cyber Command, but you also yeah. have Second Army, which dates back. How do you, how do you balance yeah, those? So we're, I'd say I'm still wrestling. We are still wrestling as a command with how to do this because the traditional structure that they live in is not the way they're working. So the structure they live in, their teams are actually, the, their teams are the real structure that they work in day to day, but those are not the companies, battalions, and brigades that they live in. So we're already uh, dealing with this and who, who does what really is what this comes down to and how do you make it in a way that uh, Maybe, maybe those traditional structures aren't right. And, and in a way, you know, we're looking, maybe this whole thing needs to be managed differently. Maybe it's, maybe it's more like a special operations approach, where there you have small teams and you keep them together as teams, and you call them teams and you keep them as teams. That's not the traditional way the Army organizes. But uh, we're, we're only uh, four and a half years old, and we you know, just got at the point where obviously exponential growth over the last uh, several months, so we're still working our way through on that. I do know, though, that uh, the importance of mission that you're working on, understanding that, how important that is, the people you're around, the technologies you get to work with, that is a really compelling factor that helps us in the military. So, Nate, on the business side, uh, how does the cybersecurity business organize, and how might it be different than a business in um, the technology uh, sector in general, and then outside that sector. Mm -hmm. uh, so I can really only speak for us, uh, but the, the, the big division really is between product companies and services companies. Um, and we are a product company. We are building software products um, overwhelmingly, a, a relatively small part of our business is services. And on the product business side, if you, let's, let's carve all the normal business functions out for a minute that everybody's familiar with, kind of finance and BD and all these things, and talk only about the technology. Um, I think you can, you can sort of break it into quarters. Um, the, the first half would be between, the, um, uh, between the, the people who are building the products and the people who are building the fuel for the products, or mixing the fuel for the products. And then you can break each of those in half again. So you have on the product side, um, the back-end developers who are essentially figuring out, okay, how do, we, how do we ingest the data, how do we store it, how do we correlate it, how do we search it, and the front-end developers who are thinking about how do we visualize it, how do we build a, an intuitive interface for real human beings. I mean, something that's plagued, I think, the security community is you've needed for too long a Carnegie Mellon PhD to figure out how these things work. I mean, it's crazy. And we're, we're all talking about this talent shortage all the time. Well, there are two ways to deal with that, right? You can hit it on the supply side or the demand side. Um, yes, we need to invest in STEM education. Yes, we need to increase the number of people with basic fluency in this field. Uh, but I think at the same time, we can also make the tools easier to use and thereby expand the base of people who can use them effectively. So uh, front end and back end developers on the software side. And then on the, on the fuel side, that's really the data side, uh, data scientists who are by and large mathematicians uh, who are writing algorithms. 
um, and, um, and then the threat intel uh, and, and uh, kind of adversary research, security researcher types who have a deep understanding of the adversary. Uh, and, and together they're um, essentially mixing the fuel that powers the products. Um, and, and I think that, that basic division is probably common across most uh, security product companies. So I'm going to ask each of you to uh, peer a little bit into the future. So what does your part of the cybersecurity field look like 10 years from now? So Molly, if we're looking at the realm of hacktivism, what does it look like in the future? How will it be the same or different from where we are right now? Well, I think there are three major pathways that hacktivism is going to be evolving in in the future. One of them is information exfiltration. So we're going to see more classified and otherwise secret information being extracted out of secret systems and published for wider use and analysis. Sorry, General. Sorry. <laughs> Um, the second is alternative infrastructure construction. Um, we're go right now, we are subject to massive network effects that keep us locked into systems like Google and Facebook and these exploitative corporate and or government systems that are open to surveillance that in many cases allow and encourage surveillance for various reasons. And so I think one thing we're going to be seeing is the construction of alternative activist oriented network systems and programs that people can move into where they have more control over their data and more control over their privacy and their own safety. And then I think we're going to see more disruptive activism. We're going to be, see more things like distributed denial of service actions. We're going to see more things where people are engaging with systems in an effort to disrupt the functioning of that system in order to di divert conversations or cause conversations that aren't happening to be occurring. And will there be, a, you started off by saying it had been mostly, not completely, mostly a Western field. Obviously, that describes the internet itself. Yep. Um, what happens as, and you're nodding your head, so it seems we'll also see hacktivism go more and more global. How does that change it other than just being more global in its scope? Well, you're going to see, I think you're going to see more people in different countries and in different cultures picking up sort of the bucket of hacktivist tools and then deploying them for their own political and social gains. And this could be something like the Arab Spring v2.0, where we see a much more technologically based tool of revolution being used and deployed. Or it could be something like a group like ISIS using more and more internet and online and te technologically based tools for their ends. These are just tactics and strategies. They're not necessarily, they don't come with built-in ethics. They don't come with a built-in morality. They can be picked up and used by anybody. So while we see these tools getting distributed, they're going to be used by various actors for various aims. And I'm not sure, I'm not sure we can predict what those are at this point. So General, what is the, what is the command? What does your role look like in this future? So, you, you know, I think we're in the middle of the information technology revolution, so I'm even hesitant to say what this will look like three years from now, but let me just offer a few options. I think based on what is going on today, authoritarian, authoritarian regimes are going to lock down their populations even tighter than ever because they're going to be able to use these tools and bend it against their own populations. I, I believe that. And I think the democratic... Uh, institutions will pursue this and it's going to become a very interesting struggle. That's one piece. Ten years from now, I think we're going to have challenges with machine-on-machine -on -machine and autonomous systems operating in this space. And what that means, I can't really tell you, but I know it's going to be a factor because that work is already ongoing. The third thing is, is I think as the, uh, often we talk a lot about cyber, but we don't talk about the data. And in a way that data is more important than the actual cyber. And what, what I mean by this is, when you talk about the extraction of secret, I, don't, I think there's a greater challenge, which is the correlation of open data using algorithms kind of, so I, my, the example I use is if you read like Manning's report on advanced persistent threat and you look at that, that's a very sophisticated document. That would have been an intelligence document 10 years ago. Today it's open source, published for everybody to use. I think that's gonna challenge this. And finally, I think, for the operators themselves, I, I see much more of a gamer mentality being used here. And what, what do I mean by that? 
I think the tools are being simplified. The tool vulnerabilities are rapidly being reverse engineered now in attacks weapons on the internet. And so what I'm starting to see is you have the offense and defense. It's really who can get the tool fastest to play it. You know, and, and so this is going to look more like an operations in game than actual tool developers, et cetera. That's going to challenge us when we start operating at those kind of speeds. And how about for someone who will be sitting in your job? What, what will be different for them than what you face now? And what might be different training that they bring to bear than you brought to the job? Well, I think um, that's a really good question. I, uh, I think you have to be very operationally focused, but I think you're going to have to have a degree of curiosity and uh, the ability to follow leading trends, both in intelligence and not, and being able to try and position the force in a way that you're not too far behind or hopefully ahead of where it's going. Uh, generally, we would say we would grow that up in the operations world, you know, multiple problems. And so, you know, you and I talked earlier about an Ender's Game type model. You know, maybe, maybe we might have to start looking at something like that in cyber where you're just constantly working in the space, but not so much that you become narrow, but in a way can we broaden you out so that as you look at problems, you avoid strategic surprise, which forms you know, dysfunctionality and paralysis at the worst, that you can operate at the speed that I think we're going to have to operate. So Nate, other than highly profitable, what does the business look like? Right. What does the role for you look like? Well, see, but you, that assumption is so problematic. I, everybody I talk to says to me, essentially, so how can you possibly screw this business up? Right? Um, there, there are lots of ways. Um, but uh, um, I'd put my money on a few trends. Um, first of all, just I think we should recognize, and look, in the space I operate at the intersection of venture capital, technology, and security, it's a highly abnormal labor market. It's a really bizarre market. It is, it is so male. It is so white. It is, it is not a diverse talent pool. Um, that, I think, contributes to suboptimal performance. Um, I think that needs to change, and I think it will change over over the decade to come. So the, the talent pool and the people side of things need to change. Um, on the product side, I think there's going to be consolidation. Um, there are, it's such a highly fragmented field right now. You know, you talk to Fortune 100 companies that have, in some cases, literally hundreds of security products deployed. Like, that's just crazy. I think Bruce Schneier said earlier that complexity is the enemy of security. So. Uh, this is a space that is characterized by features masquerading as products, products masquerading as companies, and companies masquerading as businesses. And, and they're going to they're gonna come together, um, and they need to come together. Um, it's a space, bizarrely, that only has a very small handful of big public companies. You know, that too is weird. So I think there's, there's going to be consolidation. I think you're also going to, you know, also at the same time see, you know, a larger number of big players. Um, and then on the market side, um, I mean, I think the market's going to expand almost indefinitely. The, like the great lesson, and we heard this on the stage earlier today, the great lesson of the DevOps revolution of the last decade is don't write any software, don't write and maintain any, any software yourself uh, that you can just um, outsource. So everybody's sending stuff to the cloud as they should, putting the security responsibility on the vendor. Uh, and what that means is, to some extent, every company is a technology company. Every company. Every private law firm and dental practice and, and everything. You know, Home Depot doesn't just sell hammers. Like, every company is a technology company. Um, so the market is going to get bigger and bigger and bigger. Um, and at the same time, there's this convergence happening between the federal and commercial spaces, in, in my view, because the threat landscapes have almost totally converged. We're dealing with the same threats. Um, the old days of states attacking states and companies spying on companies, like, that's very quaint, and that's not today. Um, uh, we're all dealing with essentially the same, the same threat actors, and the architectures have converged. So when the intelligence community signs a $600 million deal with Amazon Web Services, um, all of a sudden, we, you know, we really do see uh, most enterprises have similar um, architecture uh, challenges. And so the, cha the, the architectures converge, the threats converge, so I think the solutions converge. Um, and uh, you know, those, those are all trends that, that you know, I'd, I'd bet on. Cool. Well, now we're going to open it up to you in the audience. Uh, again, um, wait for the mic to come and uh, identify yourself, and right back there. 
Peter Dixon, Second Front Systems. In uh, World War I, when the French mobilized, they did so so quickly that their industry had trouble because so many of the key players had actually gone to the front and they had to go and find those guys and then send them back to get industry restarted to support the war effort. So three-part question for, for each of you. Given the premise that there is a catastrophic cyber attack on the U.S., which is not a one-off, but is the opening salvo in a sustained fight, uh, General, how do you mobilize the experts in sort of a similar type of uh, engagement effort to pull those people in to defend the nation? Uh, Molly, how do you leverage the activist groups that previously didn't see government service sort of in their future, but now that the nation's been attacked, are looking to rally to the flag? And Nate, how do you make sure that given how interwoven the private and the public sector are, that similar to the French, you're not cutting too deep into the folks who are holding up the private sector as you also now try to defend the nation itself? So I, I think I've thought a lot about this. What would this really look like? And I think the first thing is it's not solely going to be a DOD problem. DOD is going to provide its component, but you're going to have Homeland Security, FBI clearly, and private industry. Because if it's truly that big, there's no way the Department of Defense is going to be able to do this without having some sort of an interrelationship with uh, government and private. The only way that we have right now to organize inside this is, uh, uh, you know, we have the reserve component, the Army, and, and all those services have a reserve, and, and some have a National Guard. I think that has to be leveraged as well, but to think that the Department of Defense is going to be able to provide everything to work across an entire sector of critical infrastructure without taking into account the tremendous experts already working in that critical infrastructure who know their networks better than we do anyways. We come in, we always have a start point and then, uh, where you have to get familiar with the network to begin with. So I think in the eventually where we're going to have to get to is a, a much closer relationship between government and private for these true World War I type event. Civilian activist populations go where their passions are. That's what makes them different than employees or members of the armed services. Um, so if there was a situation of the type that you describe of, I would like to argue with you about that hypothetical, but I won't. Um, if there's space for them, they'll be there. If there's something for them to do, they'll be there. This may be a situation where something needs to be developed for non-professional individuals that's more reminiscent of Victory Gardens than anything else. Um, right now, there isn't a space for a lot of activists in a lot of modern civic life that's not inherently confrontational. We have things like, like civic hack days, but those aren't really well understood, they're not very well deployed, and they're not terribly effective. So space needs to be made on the part of the state and corporations that is non-threatening, non-exploitative, and worthy of people's time. I'm going to ping in a question for both of you on this, because um, there's been recent discussion of a, um, essentially online community hacktivism targeting ISIS social media and you know so we are at, we will have a debate as to whether we are physically at war but we're definitely carrying out conventional military operations we have concern about them recruiting I'm sure it's something you deal with general so what's your take on this as an illustration of that it's not the full-out grand-scale war but it's definitely playing a role in the battle space and then the question back to you general is what's your take on when you see hacktivism operating against one of your foes. It's an interesting step in sort of the informational warfare that's always been present. Um, this is sort of another, an interestingly civilian moderated form of counter propaganda and sort of emotional and affective uh, fighting in that way. Um, I'm interested to see where it develops. I don't know a whole lot about it right now, um, but it, it's certainly very fascinating. So what separates this from the earlier conversation is this is overseas, right? And so the, 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 the rules are a lot different. You know, we have in, uh, 
we have X wards, we have policy, a framework by which we conduct these operations. So to me, the challenge here is, so here you have a hacktivist community that's not connected in a way to what we're trying to overall do, and this goes to the constructs. How do we stitch this together? How do we create that space? That doesn't exist right now. And uh, you know, this might be a good discussion to, for me to have internally with the, with the team, but it is, I think it's something we have to account for, especially for something that's really large like this. I think uh, it's not solely a government problem. I mean, it, they're recruiting our young men and women off the streets, and, and you heard the other part about the, when I was with Secretary Johnson, they say the lone wolf problem. And these are being created, so the, 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 this problem is here now. We're just not sure we have the right frameworks for this kind of for this type of information confrontation that we're seeing now. Mm -hmm. So, Nate, all-out war, good or bad for business? Oh, man, <laughs> I mean, look, terrible, right? Terrible. Like it's uh, easy, easy, easy to say that uh, bad headlines are good for these businesses, but at the end of the day, I mean, we're all you know citizens first, so. Um, that, that's not a, not a good outcome. Um, I think that uh, I wish that I would, under that scenario, as a citizen, wish that I would have a hard time hanging on to my people because they'd all be fleeing to work for General Cardone, but for the reason that you described earlier, it's very hard for him to take them. Um, so I, th I think you know, it would be a question of how do you support in place. And um, um, that, in my view, kind of comes back to the whole point of uh, the security community being a community and the importance of sharing information and intelligence. I think that. Uh, and, and we've seen this repeatedly at you know sort of smaller scale, but um, you know an immediate willingness, a bias to share, a bias to engage, a bias to uh, uh, collaborate, not sit around and say, oh, "I wish we could help," but there's no contract vehicle in place. So I, you know the, the bias is always to engage, and the bias is to share. Are you a supporter of the? Um, so we have our model of National Guard and reserves, and then both of you have identified sort of a gap between. Do you have an alternative model that Estonia has of their um, Cyber Defense League that yeah. allows uh, it, it fills that space in the middle? It's almost like a militia or civil air patrol. Um, now some business doesn't like that because it actually becomes more directly competitive with contracts just coming from the communal side. What, what's your take on these alternative models? Yeah, I, I'm, I'm not, a, not a big military personnel expert, but, but having lived it for a few years as a junior officer, I can tell you that after a couple of combat tours, uh, I was eager to go to grad school and try to understand, you know, at a, from a broader perspective, what this was that I'd been a part of early on in Afghanistan and Iraq. And that opportunity didn't exist for me in the Marines. And so, you know, ultimately, for a whole bunch of reasons, I decided that it was time for me to get out and go do something else. Um, I think the military, and by extension the nation, would be well served to have a much more flexible career path kind of across the board. Um, we should have opportunities for, we, the, the military should have opportunities for sabbaticals, more creative on-ramps and off-ramps, uh, exchanges with industry um, of the, the, the sort that, that the general mentioned. Uh, I, I think there are a lot of things we could do to modernize that whole system and result in a, a increased ability to marshal all of our national power. Okay, let's take another question um, right over here. Let's get a mic to him if we can. Did you have your hand up? No, no. Oh. Yeah, hi. Um, so my name's Morgan. I'm the director of security at First Look Media. And you, you brought up an interesting point, which was uh, about the security community. Uh, so when I, I wonder where, where we can find the next generation of cyber warriors, I actually think about the community acting as a community. Um, and about a, a blog post that was written a while back um, by Jeff Moss, who's the founder of DEF CON and Black Hat, the US's most well-known security industry conferences. And the title of that blog post was FEDS, We Need Some Time Apart. And it was sort of about the actions of uh, sort of US Cyber Command and the NSA towards US citizens. And so I guess what I wanted to ask is, do you not feel that there's actually been this sort of reputational impact where the security industry is probably less eager to work together with government and military than they were in the wake of 9-11? So the whole rallying behind the flag is actually significantly less likely to happen today than it would have been 10 years ago. Any takers on that? 
Well, I'll, I'll echo Admiral Rogers' comment. There's clearly a trust issue, right? But at the same time, in, in so I'll, I'll use it like this. On the 10th of September, when I was working in the Pentagon, that the world was one way, and the next day it was another way. And the way that people thought about things was dramatically different. And so I think it depends on the situation, one, but to me, I, we shouldn't have to wait for some big coalescing event. I think we need to sort out how we create a, uh, a security fabric, cybersecurity fabric, and I like to use that word, you know, between government, private, that, that's gonna work. And I don't think we'll always agree, but we could at least have a framework by which if something happened, we're not starting from scratch. You know, so the 10 days after 9-11 to me, when you go back and look at those days, they were quite fascinating to me. Because there's a lot of talk about how do we stitch this together. Uh, and I, I don't think we can afford to wait that long. I think here we should think about how exactly would we you know, what, what's, how do you on-ramp an activist community? How would we do that? And I was just, when you said that, I was thinking, okay, this is a fusion cell concept. Okay, here's the problem. Everybody that wants anything to help in any way come here, right? So it's a voluntary. It's not, we direct you to come here. These sort of things, I think, have to be looked at. Okay. Let's do another question from anyone in the back then. Or actually, right, right over here is fine. Okay. Hi, uh, Sean Lingus with Federal Computer Week. Um, General Cardone, can you talk a little bit about the uh, cyber protection teams that uh, Army CIO Farrell has recently tasked, um, I think, you to set up? Um, what are your goals for those? Um, when will they be accomplished? And um, can you also, in your answer, hopefully, mention uh, the challenge, the specific challenge to Army on cyber as opposed to other services? Yeah. So I'll, I'll start with your last question first. Uh, the problem with the Army is maybe twofold. One, and, and I think the Marines have the same issue, although they're smaller. Uh, one is the Army's the one service that's not yet fully collapsed all of its networks, as opposed to the other services. At the same time, the Army's a distributed organization. So it's always gonna have a wide, diverse network. And so that, that's that piece. So the, um, so we're standing up, Army Cyber Command is standing up these teams. Uh, they, uh, there's a model by which we're all growing them. All the services are growing them the same. As we're working our way through how we're using them, uh, you know, we've identified, for example, we have to, out of these teams, we're using them in ways we hadn't really thought of. Uh, I think that's a good thing uh, right now, but we are still, I'd say in the exploratory stage, before we start changing them, maybe we shouldn't change too quick yet because most of my teams are less than a year old. And so what we've done is when we run against specific problems, we just organize internally, create a little task force, and then use that task force to accomplish the mission. I don't feel constrained by an organizational construct. We have a mission and then we organize accordingly to accomplish that. Uh, there's gonna be 20 uh, plus for active, and then there'll be 21 in the Guard and Reserve as well. Uh, and the first one for the Army National Guard is already on active duty. And we're learning a lot about how to do that as well. I, I just wanna say that all the people on these teams are gonna be trained to a common standard. So the teams from the Marines, Navy, Air Force, Army, will all be interchangeable, which I think is really, really important. So roughly half the teams that are being built are in this vein, and I think it's really, really important. Some say, you know, we need to do a lot more work on the defense, and this is a manifestation of organization and resources that go against that. Okay, let's get another question. Right over here. Hi, uh, my question is about um, the government's relationship with open source. Um, I, well, as, as learning to code, I found that the open source community was very, very helpful in teaching me skills, um, understanding how to code in a way that's uh, readable and such. But is that, um, I mean, is that a community that can be tapped into? I know that uh, Goldman Sachs, for instance, they had a huge problem with Sergey Alenikov, who was using open source coding to help him create um, algorithms and models for uh, their uh, high-frequency trading, and then got 
arrested by the FBI for uh, supposedly stealing secrets that he didn't actually steal. Um, so if there isn't a relationship that the government can have with like that open source community, is there a public-private partnership with uh, a company like um, Mr. Fix that could you know, bridge that gap? So let's, let's frame it this way. Um, how would you describe each part of the ecosystem's relationship and attitude towards open source and more broadly, self-training, how is that viewed? So, you know, let's walk through each of the parts of the system. All for it. All Yay. for it. Um, this is, it's an activist development system, essentially, um, sort of no matter which way you slice it, whether you're doing it in companies, um, it's still a way to make that information open and accessible to people outside, or whether you're doing it sort of within, within the activist population itself. Um, and as a result, that makes it very threatening to most businesses, to I think many sectors of the government, and I think it's an uphill battle to get those sectors of our society to accept it, which makes me sad. But. General open source? This year Army Research Lab put a whole code set, I can't remember the name, out for open source development. So I think we're starting to look at this. It's not like it was before. Now, what that looks like down the road, I can't tell you, but right now I think we're starting to look at open source as another option. It's essential, we, but it's a two-way street. We consume from it and we contribute to it. Um, and uh, I wouldn't be able to recruit and retain the kind of people I need to if we didn't. Okay. Let's get a question from someone in the back. Uh, yeah, right there. Hi, I'm with Stanford University's Cyber Initiative. I was wondering what you all identify as the gaps in the education profiles of the talent pools that you each see. Molly, are there gaps in education? That's an interesting question because the population pool is so diverse, but what I would say is there's universally a gap in support coming, in, coming into the activist sector. Uh, there's a huge problem and there has been a huge problem in sort of activist populations where there's an expectation that you will sacrifice huge parts of your life in order to engage in this type of political activism. And that leads to burnout and that leads to people fleeing the sector and giving up and going and hiding in the mountains and not dealing with this anymore because it depresses them. Um, and that's really sad. And so while I wouldn't say there's an education gap, I will say that there is an outside support gap and there needs to be a broader understanding within both the activist community at large and within broader society that people who engage in this type of civil service and this type of civil activism are doing it at great cost to themselves and that shouldn't actually be part of the life cycle of activists. And one of the things you bring to this is a multidisciplinary approach. Do you see that as um, rare in this space? or not? Um, I don't think it's necessarily rare. I think it's rarer in academia. Um, mm -hmm. It's rarer for academics to be approaching this type of research from a multidisciplinary angle. And I sort of stumbled into that because comms departments is where they put the internet these days, um, no matter what you're doing. <laughs> um, and so, but the activists themselves tend to be very multidisciplinary. They come from all over. Um, they come from all sorts of disciplines and educational and personal backgrounds, and that's to the benefit of the work that they're doing. Uh, so I won't call them unmet needs, but two of the less met needs from my perspective are uh, technology leaders. So they're great technologists, they're great business leaders. There's an insatiable demand for technology leaders. Uh, and translators, people who can translate uh, between the technical community and the non-technical community, between public policy and business um, to the public as, at large. Uh, I, I would identify technology leaders and translators as two places that maybe university initiatives can contribute hugely. General? We've been thinking about this a lot because we, we consume. Uh, so what, what disciplines need to be brought in and more and more we're thinking you need a basic degree so you understand how things work. We can teach you the skills how to put stuff on top of it. So in other words, uh, a computer science degree is a little bit better than I'm a master in Python because Python might not be what we're using three, four years from now. But if you understand how computers work and you understand how the code is, so this is, but we're not, I don't want you to think we've, figured this out, so we're trying to figure out what, is, what are the disciplines that we have to be in and, and 
Oh, I take your point. This is multidiscipline. I mean, I mean we, Nate and I were talking earlier, you have operators, you have to have analysts. We, now we have this whole data component. Uh, how do we, what are the basic disciplines for each one of those? And then how do we get the people that can put it all together? And then uh, there's an innovative portion of this and there's the ones that operate it at scale. So a, a lot more work to be done here. So I wanna end by asking each of you a, a question more about yourself than the field. How do you train yourself? What sources of information do you turn to to stay on top of your particular sectors? Um, each of you are up here on stage have given us great comments, um, experts, lead organizations. Give us insight into how you prep yourself in that role. And I'll, we'll just go in, in order again, so Molly. This is an awkward career time to ask that question because I'm reading for my comprehensive exams right now. Um, so I'm prepping by going back, um, rather far back into the history of disruptive activism and the history of both the, act, the actions and movements but also the theory um, because I, there's this debate in social movement theory and social movement studies about whether we need a whole new theory of activism to deal with the internet or whether we can adapt addition, theories that already exist. And clearly, I'm falling more on the let's look back at what we've already discovered and what we've already talked about and see how that can be applied to what's going on on the internet. And I think we, it's really helpful to go back to even movements as far back as you know, machine breaking in England in the 16 and 1500s to look at how people dealt with technology then, technology that was coming into their lives and causing problems for them and for their families and how that theory can be taken to how people are dealing with disruptive technology in the present day, how disruptive activism sort of talks backwards through time and also forwards through time. Mm -hmm. General? So Peter, maybe uh four ideas. One is I think you have to carve time out each day for some sort of self-study to try and stay current and it's fairly diverse in what that means depending on what I'm having to work on. Second is, you know, relationships with... How much of that is um, open source in the other meaning versus pulled within the network classified? Well, it's, because I do this in my own time, I tend to do that at my house, right? Which means it's not classified. So I... I, I uh, I get enough of that at work. I have a sense where that's moving. Uh, but I would say the relationships with industry, other government agencies, and academia are really important to try and stay current. You know, so uh, visiting some of the larger companies, having wide ranging discussions always creates a lot of ideas. Actually, the challenge is, is to implement the ideas. Right? You get lots of ideas, but you have to neck it down into what you can actually deliver. But I think this, uh, in a way, trying to create a fabric, right, that generates a sense of co constant learning, but not learning just for me, it's learning for the organization, right? It's connecting the organization to all of that. Uh, well, both you, Peter, and Molly are represented on my bookshelf, so that's, uh, that's a start. Um, I, I spend a lot of time talking to our customers, uh, and you know, it's, it's a luxury to be able to walk in and say, you know, in the context of doing business, Tell me about your problems. Tell me what's going on that you see and I don't. Um, and then I get to do the same thing with our team. So having daily access to dozens and dozens of technologists. So if I walk up and say, please get me smart on X, um, they'll actually do it uh, sometimes, is, uh, um, is, a, is a huge, you know, again, luxury. Great. Well, please join me in thanking three great panelists for coming this out for us. <laughs>